Welcome back, everyone, to Victoria 2. And as you can see, probably from the fucking thumbnail or whatever, <coughs> we're playing the East India Company. And holy shit, this is loud or not? There we go. Uh, hopefully, this is not too loud because whenever I alt tab out in this game to check the volume levels on OBS, uh, the game sound stops working because it's an old game and, uh, you know. It's got quirks like this one. Anyway, we're going to be playing as the East India Company. Uh, and, oh Jesus Christ, the War of British Aggression against the Sixth Toza War. Against Toza, or however the fuck you're supposed to pronounce that thing. Anyway, uh, so, uh, be prepared for lots of bad British accent and uh, lots of bad colonialism. Uh, so, uh... Let's get started. Essentially, what the fuck are we doing? Uh, we are in HFM mod, and uh, in HFM you can play as the East India Company, which was kind of like a weird mix between a corporation, a colony, and a country that the Brits created to sort of oversee India. Uh, well, in, in, originally it was only a trading kind of thing, uh, a trading enterprise, uh, but then they took over, like, all of India. And it's like, whoops, now it's... Um, now it's a country, <laughs> and it was not a good idea. Like, the, the East India Company has, let's just say, a incorrect, um, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, historical legacy. <laughs> it's, it had problems. Anyway, uh, we're not here to address that. We are here to fight the Indians and become... The greatest colonialist ever maybe I don't know we'll see so basically uh, we're you know gonna be advancing for the game splendid isolation uh, yeah right it will break alliances for any with any greater power except for Portugal Ottomans Belgium or Japan um, in my experience that does not work anyway so we'll just we'll just not do that anyway so basically um, we start off in India, we control most of India, uh, but we are a puppet of uh, the United Kingdom, obviously. Uh, if we take a look at our diplomacy, we can see that we are protected by... The, uh, I just... See, Victoria 2, some of the shit that uh, they put in this game would not fucking not fly today, because it's like, oh yeah, we are... A protectorate. Um, we are protected by. Uh, we are a part. We're also a partially civilized nation, or we're an uncivilized nation. I believe we would show off, like in, uh, yeah, partially westernized. Oh no, they don't use civilized. They use westernized. But for example, this one is a primitive nation. So we're. Uh, it's just this kind of shit would not happen in a game in two thousand and like whatever. Um, so. What does this mean? If you have ever played Victoria 2, you know that countries in this game are divided in essentially two classes. There's class A, which is westernized or civilized <laughs> countries uh, that essentially have developed an industrial economy. That's basically what that's supposed to represent, an industrial economy and a somewhat... Um, you could say recognizing of... Uh, like liberal values, quote unquote, country. Although you could have uh, uncivilized, or sorry, um, not uncivilized, fucking uh, what you might call it, uh, absolute monarchies. Be um, yeah, France has declared war on Algeria. What could possibly go wrong from that? Uh, you can have um, like uh, absolute monarchies be civilized, but. It's yeah, it's kind of a weird mix of having developed modern institutions and uh, oh, actually, uh, need to do this. Having developed modern institutions and having industrialized, and then there's uncivilized ones, uh, and then there's also partially civilized ones like us, who have gone through a few of these reforms. Now, reforms over here are gonna get replaced by something else once we civilize. While we are uncivilized, we cannot research anything ourselves. We can only get it through clicking uh, with our research points on a reform, and that's going to give us a tech. And these reforms are, you know, obviously like transportation system. Do we know what a railroad is? Um, industrial construction. Do we know what a factory is? Administration reform. 
do we have separation of powers, I guess that's supposed to be, and, like, civil service. Land reform, uh, you know, is it, like, a re really weird feudal kind of system, or is it relatively organized along market lines? That kind of stuff. So, so far, we are 95% westernized as the East India Company. However, we have a modifier called the East India Company over here, which gives us a lot of leadership modifier. Leadership modifier gives us generals, which is obviously really good. Uh, well, obviously, if you haven't played the game, you don't know, but generals are like really, really important because if you don't have a general in your armies, you lose uh, pretty much automatically because you have a minus two dice roll penalty because of how the combat works. That's very important. Um, yeah, going back to reforms. Um... It also gives us less supply consumption and blah, 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 a bunch of stuff, but also minus 255% research points modifier. So research points is um, how you get the reforms. Now, because we have this minus 255%, it's not like we get, you know, less than a quarter than the research points that we'd normally get. We just go under because apparently this is, cum uh, yeah, this is like cumulative. Um, you just add and subtract. And so, since our research points generation is increased by 1.1% 1. 1 by our plurality, which is just like a, you know, it's a meter that uh, determines how many voices are heard in the in the government or whatever, so how pluralistic we are. Uh, it's just translated automatically. Um, so 1%, 1%. Then we get 50% from technology, aka, like, uh, re uh, reforms that we have taken, basically, or... Uh, Technology can also be uh, this one, Enlightenment Philosophy. Heh, <laughs> we are so enlightened. Uh, we are so enlightened, and these Indians are not. Uh, however, minus 255, so we don't get anything. Uh, we actually lose 1.73 per day, but it looks like we're gaining it because the game isn't really supposed to work this way. You're not really supposed to go under, but HFM is weird. So what this is supposed to represent, I guess, is that, yes, we know about, like, all this technology and shit, and all this government, eh, Afghanistan being a weirdo, and all this government, uh, stuff, but since we're a colony, it's not because we are researching, it's because the UK is doing it, so we're gonna get periodic events to give us technologies, but we're not gonna get any reforms done, ever. So, yeah, that whole mechanic for us is not gonna be there, and while we are uncivilized, Oh, yeah, so uncivilized compared to the mother country. Uh, basically, we cannot research anything, and we cannot um, industrialize. We cannot build any industries. Now, another reason why we cannot build any industries, um, and by the way, uh, we do have the railroad base level research so we can railroad up and that's really really useful because railroads are good uh, so basically what happens is um, you can only uh, build industrial facilities in places that are your full states for some reason our only full state is company Rajputana which is just this little weird thing over here uh, our capital is in Calcutta, which is a colonial province. At least 1% of the population need to be bureaucrats of an accepted culture in order to convert this colonial concession into a full national state. Current ratio is 0.01%, incorporating as a state cost 12 colonial power points. What does this mean? This means that we are, like, I think this state is a full state only because like the game does not allow uh, a, a country with fully um colonial government but basically we're just like we're just like a, a colony that's a country essentially uh so like normally a country would have their own regions be full states obviously but then you go into their colonial regions and it's colonial provinces so that allows them to industrialize in their own native, native lands, but unless they spend a lot of efforts actually like doing bureaucrats in their colonial provinces, they can't really exploit the plentiful native manpower to build like a bunch of really, really cheap factories, really, really cheap labor. And uh, that's how, you know, uh, colonial nations don't just snowball completely out of proportion. But um, obviously this is a big issue because guess what? Uh, we are... We're, our only accepted culture is English. 
So this is pretty bad because if you check out, our country doesn't really have a lot of English people in it. Um, if you check out the whole East India Company and check out the cultures, it, like English doesn't even show up because there are just so many Indians and so few English. So we're fucked basically. Uh, wait, we have UA people? What the f Oh, uh, Malacca, right? Uh, UA are Chinese. Yeah, as you can see, there's like a few English pops, like some soldiers and, uh, you know, people in Ceylon that have been spawned in uh, from the beginning, but it's not like, uh, yeah, we're gonna, just gonna have to rely on our slaves essentially for, for everything because we're just a tiny minority of English people ruling over this fucking huge thing. Uh, anyway, so our national focus, we're gonna first encourage intellectuals because we want people to know how to read. Um, now, common logic would dictate that you'd need to focus on the bureaucrats first uh, so that you can, you know, get your bureaucrats up. So national focus is something that, uh, and I'm going in this digression to explain everything just because I, I know that most of my viewers, you know, c come from Hearts of Iron. So maybe they don't know how Victoria 2 works. So essentially the way Victoria 2 works is that uh, you have populations, pops, in your states that do things. They have professions. Uh, and they're divided between different social classes. There's middle income, upper income, and uh, lower income. Upper income is upper classes, uh, aka, let's see if we can find the correct thing, capitalists and landowners. We don't have any capitalists because we are not a uh, civilized nation. Then middle class are artisans, which produce goods, bureaucrats, which rule things, uh, intellectuals, clerks, and officers. And then in the lower classes, there's craftsmen, craftsmen which is the industrial uh, workers, farmers, laborers, aka miners, and um, yeah, miners and plantation people, serfs, slaves, which we don't have any, and soldiers. So basically, what you do to uh, make your people be of one profession or another is that you encourage it. So like, for example, right now we're encouraging intellectuals and they're growing. The reason we're encouraging intellectuals is that you want to have intellectuals that are around two or, well, if you're like turbo, uh, you know, turbo like literacying, uh, literacying, if you're turbo educating your people, you want that at four, but that, that would be excessive. Because we just have so many people, we're gonna go for 2% uh, to educate your people and make them know how to read, which is a really useful thing because it translates directly into the research points you get. And uh, the research points you get translate into technology, which is power. So uh, that people know how to read is pretty important. Let's just say that. So um, another thing we can do is take take a trade policy. Uh, now, several members of several members. This is like a decision that everyone can take. Several members of the inner circles of the government have gathered with the company governor in Calcutta to discuss in detail the blah, 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 blah. So we can either have uh, Smithianism, free trade essentially, uh, no such trade policy, or never burden me with this again. Now, you can unlock different trade policies as you unlock, I believe, uh, commerce technologies. I don't, I'm not sure because it... Yeah, like the the mod is like this is from something from the HFM mod, but the mod isn't that well incorporated that it actually tells you what gets unlocked where, um, in terms of like the mod events and the mod decisions. But we are fine with external commerce should be free because it increases tariff efficiency and administrative efficiency um, at the cost of maximum tariffs. Maximum tariffs is how much you can get the tariffs to be. So we're just gonna get the tariffs up to 10%, which is gonna allow us to lower taxes. Hmm. We're gonna increase military spending to maximum, and we have education and administration at maximum uh, spending, because again, we want the administrative efficiency of states to be up, because it directly affects, um, it directly affects basically everything. Administrative efficiency is one of the most important things in the game, basically. Because it affects how well your government, like, can do things, which is obviously quite important. Oh, there goes Afghanistan, being a derp again. It affects how well your government can do things, so it's a really, really, uh, 
important thing. Like, if we, for example, take a look at... Uh, now it actually doesn't like directly show, but for example, if we had factories, we'd see that administrative efficiency actually helped. Um, actually helped with um, productive production efficiency or throughput, as it uh, sorry yeah no throughput as it's called in this game. And yeah, this game also has like a lot of really really weird, um, really really weird terms that you have to learn because it's really really complicated but hey that's fine and uh, yeah so basically we will not be doing that much for a while um, but first we're gonna be expanding our army up to our maximum size which is 70 brigades and um, as you can see also our army has um, objectives or our, our units have objectives before them like Avadi or whatever uh, there are also like English ones. This is because the pops that I told you about can be soldiers and the soldiers are of a certain culture. So what that means is that if one culture gets really, really angry at you and wants you dead and wants to like rise up for independence or something, the pops of that culture will rise up and uh, try to kill you with the, with the guns that you've given them. So, yeah, Victoria 2 is just an awesome game like that. Anyway, uh, so I feel like the, the first uh, action that we're going to see very, very soon is the Opium War, which should be in, in 1840. And um, this is relatively important for, well, the history of Asia as a whole. So but essentially what British India was all about for uh, the UK government was a mix of, like, big dick erection and trade. Now, what do I mean by that? Essentially, as you can see, for example, like the troops that we're recruiting here in Bombay are English artillery because the soldiers here are English. They're supposed to be like mercenaries or whatever. Um, or maybe convicts, uh, although we're not a penal colony. So basically, um, British India was a combination of trade profits in Asia and big dick conquest because of the distance between the motherland the uk and you know the far east at this point in history before the suez canal going from the uk to canton and back took like six months um so going to calcutta would be something like two months less or one month less so you'd imagine that like uh, orders from the United Kingdom to India and, you know, reports from India to the United Kingdom would take for fucking ever to reach there. This is before the telegraph, this is before the telephone, this is before the steamship. Well, okay, the steamship was already sort of around, but, and yeah, it was also before the Suez Canal, so sail ships had to go all the way from fucking, like, London or whatever to the Cape to Calcutta, uh, you cannot do that, obviously, in, like, certain seasons because shits get, shit gets nasty in the sea. So the communication between uh, the East India Company and uh, the UK was, let's just say, sporadic, lackluster, and uh, not enough to really direct things from London. So while there was a commission in... Um, in Britain that was supposed to oversee, a government commission that was supposed to oversee what the East India Company did. Let's just say that it didn't really do it because, well, well it couldn't really do it as well as it was supposed to because of the simple logistics difficulties. So what you have is that the East India Company, of which I don't know that much about, like all this that I'm that I'm saying is you need to, you need to take all of this with a grain of salt because I know it from studying other things that mention the East India Company, but I've never studied the East India Company, so yeah, just just know that it might, I might be saying stupid stuff, but whatever. So basically, what happens is uh, the East India Company becomes sort of a refuge, both in terms of like the army of the East India Company, which was kind of like this weird contractor kind of thing. Um, where you could buy, well, I mean, in the normal British army at this point, you could buy commissions, aka, like, officers could buy their officer status. 
but like this was even more so in the East Asian company. So it becomes like kind of a hub for adventurers and like nasty people, like, you know, mercenaries, all that kind of stuff. Um, and like aristocrats of like dreams of glory of like, you know, let's just go to where the uncivilized brown people are so that we can get easy glory or something, uh, this kind of stuff. So what happens is uh, that a lot of what a lot of what the British in India did uh, probably would have pretty much horrified like the current British government, but it's not like they knew about it. It's a bit like how today you don't like the U.S. government doesn't really you know look into what their overseas troops or whatever do, but this is before like you know military discipline and the cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> And like spy drones and you know bugging things and oh the ascension of Queen Victoria today in the year of our Lord 1838 William the fourth by the grace of God King of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland defender of the faith died in Windsor Castle oh no and I know that this is not like a British accent or whatever but I just yeah and as you can see a new toy so we just get these periodic events as long as we're a protectorate of the UK um, giving us technology so we just get strategic mobility for free strategic mobility is this one so we can get uh level two fortifications now and it's actually quite important we're going to be building fortifications uh there is a reason for that but we're not gonna talk about that yet of course we want to fortify up the border with the uh, chinese now building every single fort costs fourteen thousand pounds but since we're taxing the hell out of the trade with the tariffs, and since we are also taxing the hell out of the natives, um, the uncivilized, it's no biggie. Now, um, so that was the whole conquest and like weird colonial hubris aspect of the East India Company, but it wasn't the only thing, there was also the trade, right? Now, why was the East India Company really, really important for trade? Not because of India. This is actually kind of a misconception that like, the misconception is like, oh, the British come in and they murder the Indians and they take their resources or whatever. And they set back the Indians fucking 200 years or whatever, just to get rich. And they, you know, fucking plunder the wealth of India to make Britain fucking rich as hell. This is only a partial truth. It is true that they come in and they plunder everything and you know, they set back the Indians. Uh, you know, they, they had a relatively advanced pre-industrial economy, as far as I know, but, you know, it doesn't really work out that well in the end for them now, does it? And uh, still today, they're having to deal with the legacy of this whole, like, hey, we're gonna come in and take your shit. But uh, the East India Company was actually in the red for most of its history. Like, the, the accounts of the East India Company, which was, again, still supposed to be a company, um, were in the negative. They were going in debt. What in the world made the East India Company profitable then so that, you know, the British government would keep it until the 1850s? Cough, cough, uh, spoilers for what's coming. Basically, oh, Jesus Christ, this, the Sikh Empire, Alec, oh, okay, interesting. Because uh, there's going to be a war with the Sikh Empire, so whatever they do is going to be relatively important for us. So basically, um, uh, the answer is China. And since you're on my channel, you probably should have known that the answer was China because the answer is always China around here now, is it? So basically, um, the East India Company was important because it was a, it was a middleman between Briti the British government and the British traders and the Chinese government and the Chinese traders. So how uh, trade with China worked is that it spiked the fuck up in the 18th century for a very, very simple reason. Uh, well, actually, a few. Um, the Chinese produced a lot of goods because they had a very, very, like, relatively advanced economy. It wasn't an industrial economy. It was still, a, like, a rural, rural kind of semi-feudal weird shit. But they had a really advanced economy uh, compared to European feudalism. And they produced a lot of goods that the Europeans fucking liked. Like, as you can see, tea, silk, 
all this the porcelain uh, which should be produced around like here or something but apparently there's no porcelain uh, there's no porcelain resource uh, and yeah so ba that's basically you know the goods that the Europeans bought a lot I'm not sure why so many provinces in China produce tea in this mod uh, or in this game it's not supposed to be this widespread. Like, it's not like the entire the of China fucking produced tea. There were grain areas, you know, too, and other things, but whatever. So, uh, during the 18th century, the British got fucking addicted to tea. Like, really, really fucking addicted to tea. And um, the only place in the world that produced tea was the UK, or is China. Now, we know today tea coming from a bunch of places, notably like India as well, like Darjeeling is a very, very famous tea-producing area. But, oh, hey, um, hey, look, the Sindh are trying to kill us. And, you know, one thing that I hate is that it doesn't tell you when nations declare war on you because we're not a sovereign nation, and so technically they're declaring war on the UK. Uh, Jesus Christ. So we're going to go in and kill the Sindhis. This is going to be relatively easy. Why? Because we have six army technologies. And the Sindhis... <laughs> the Sindhis, like Kaiserreich. The Sindhis have one military technology. Well, we have six. So obviously, we are... We have some advantages. Um, unfortunately, our leader is bad at attacking. Rip. So that's going to give us a minus. So we're going to be losing quite a bit. But hopefully, it's just our Indian slaves. Oh, actually, another reason why it's going to be really, really strong, um, it's going to be, or rather, really, really easy to kill these people is because we have guards, which is really weird because guards is supposed to be a tech, like, you're supposed to get guards after, like, a lot of techs have been researched, but apparently we, we start off with them, so that's good for us. Um, so, and we're going to go and siege their shit. Sindh is, like, this proto-Pakistan, basically. Um... So, how do you go about getting tea if you're Britain? You take it from China. How do you take it from China? Well, the Chinese had this weird thing called the Canton system during the Qing Dynasty, where basically, which is the current, you know, Chinese government, which is basically all foreign trade uh, from... Okay, foreign. So, basically, the Chinese had, like, two classes of foreigners. There were people within the tributary system that were technically subjects of the Celestial Empire. Technically. Um, even though they weren't literally part of the Empire's control. Oh, and there we go. We killed the Sindhis. Um, go back to Bombay, thank you. So basically, um, they could trade at a lot of ports. And the main one was uh, Fuzhou, here in Fujian. And that was people from, like, Southeast Asia, the Philippines, you know, um, yeah, like, the Siam, Vietnam, all that stuff. And there goes the War of the Triple Alliance, which is another interesting topic that we're never going to have time to talk about. Burmese, all these kinds of people. Uh, they could send their, you know, junk trade or whatever all the way to, like, you know, Taiwan and Fujian. And that trade was also open to, again, people from the Philippines, so it was also open to the Spanish. Uh, and this was important because... Uh, we're gonna get to it. Um, that's La Hedge, which is like Aden, so we don't care about that. So basically, um, that was people that were recognized as like sort of class A barbarians by the Chinese, because for, for them, everyone who wasn't Chinese was a barbarian. Uh, so those are the Class A Barbarians. The Class B Barbarians were, like, the Westerners, essentially. Uh, what they call the, uh, sort of, Sea Nations. The Western Sea Nations. Because they came in by boats. <laughs> that's, uh, you know, that, that's uh, basically uh, Imperial Chinese ethnograph Ethnography 101. If they come in by boats, they're Western Sea Countries. And uh, the most hated ones were the British, apparently. Um, I guess because they were the most insistent. And so, how do they get trade? They were restricted to Guangzhou, uh, or Canton, as it is known in, uh, in English, uh, which is this city right here. Um, you notice that there's Hong Kong nearby, and there's, it's connected. 